So it's mm. it's actually an interesting paradox. And the the economist Michael Hudson points this out. Historically, the societies with the freest markets in history were the societies that had the strongest governments. Not necessarily the biggest governments or the most bloated ones, but the governments with the most integrity, with the most strength, with the most sovereignty and the most independence. Because sovereignty means you don't answer to private interests within your society. Say what you like about the Communist Party in China. They're not controlled by the billionaires over there. As a matter of fact, the billionaires get thrown in jail and tried all the time for corruption. And politicians who are caught taking bribes or getting lobbied, they get shot, you know? So they don't play around with that. And actually, that ensures China's market could be freer. I'd argue it's a freer market than what we have here. Even right now, they're cracking down on monopolies to help small businesses and help more middle middle level businesses. We do the opposite here. We make it really hard on small businesses, actually. We tax them to the moon. If you can break out of being a small business, it's like a miracle here, right? You're you have everything stacked against you. If you're a middle class person in this country, taxes are meant to weigh you down to the utmost extent so you could never rise to the ranks and replace them because our government's captured by a monopoly. I actually think libertarians would probably agree with me on that for the most part. When these revolutions tend to happen, like happened in the Soviet Union, there tends to be a level of resentment that kicks in. And there are people who are idealistic and who really know their marks and who understand how the society should be. But then ushered in behind them are the guys who are a little bit resentment of the rich people. Uh, they're resentful of the rich people and they come in and want to stab them in the back and take power. I think that those forces can often be very, very hard to stave off. Hard to stave off in every society though, mind you. So do you think that communism is a, can be a little bit too idealistic in the sense that they don't really expect the guys who are going to come in and behind and shoot the old guard? Um, I, I have no illusions about the harshness of history and how it unfolds or even how harsh the future is probably going to be. What I can say about some of the differences with those revolutions compared to now is they didn't have a, a middle class, quote unquote. They didn't have self-made rich people, quote unquote. What they had was a generations of a landed aristocracy, which is like a small, small minority of the population that ruled by the whip, you know, that ruled by serfdom, by by violent force, actually, directly. So imagine if you're like some peasant and all you're used to is like this tiny, tiny blood sucking minority, like whipping you and your ancestors for generations and generations, you're going to have a lot of resentment. Mm. Now here in America, we don't really have, we have slavery, of course, that's over. Slavery's gone after the civil war. But besides that, we kind of more or less don't have the feudal like relations of pure domination, like in Europe. And a lot of the rich that became rich in America were people who were just successful at running businesses and being entrepreneurs. So I don't think there, I, and you know, when I talk to working class people, I don't sense resentment against successful entrepreneurs. What I- I don't really I, mean the working class. I, 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 I more mean the sort of intellectuals and the people, because when I see resentment, normally I see the guys with the glasses and the sort of like scuffed okay. jackets who work in universities, who have been there for 20 years and who hate the capitalists and the competent guys who they went to school with, who went, who always got the chicks at school, who started a business as successful and they're still there sort of like writing books that no one reads, you know? I mean, if it's any consolation, those people already can't stand me. They hate, they hate my guts. Not to, not flattering so myself. So I've seen actually. <laughs> but, but, uh, no, I mean, I think also it's a matter of historical fact. I mean, I can I can name a guy like that, Trotsky, right? Leon Trotsky probably was like that, right? Those people end up being the fiercest opponents of the revolution and the new government and the new order. I mean, they see all of these Chad peasants rising to the ranks because of new opportunities unleashed. And then these are like these glasses wearers, basically, who are sitting there in resentment that like all these other people are becoming successful and they're denigrating their their previous you know sense of self esteem and position. So no, I, I definitely understand the factor of resentment, but in terms of how that plays out in revolutionary situations, I think as long as a party or an organized group like the Bolsheviks, like the Communist Party of China, remains firmly rooted in having its base of power in the people, rather than these people in universities, rather than these kind of intellectuals and these city dwellers, let's say, um, 
you know, baristas. I, I <laughs> it's another thing I got in trouble for was yeah. kind of saying that baristas are not really it's true <laughs> proletarians. You know, that's not yeah, really yeah. what they had in mind when they were talking. But I, I digress. I don't want to get into it. Um, it's 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 like it's like it's like you know if if I don't know if I could say this on YouTube, but if a certain red hat wearing group of people wanted to stage a revolution in America, what would that look like? I doubt it would empower the glasses wearing people, right? So no, I mean, it, to be fair, those people are big into like calling themselves communism and like Marxism as an outlet for their resentment. One 100%. thing I found very interesting about your interview with Tim Pool was with the moment when you said the seed, something along the lines of the seed bed of the next revolution is going to come from the MAGA crowd rather yeah. than the sort of far left ideologue crowd. That actually resonated with me a fair bit because when I look at the far left Antifa type crowds, yes, they're very sort of like quote unquote revolutionary in their spirit, I guess. And they go to these protests and they want to sort of overthrow the man. These are the guys who, when you think about communism, these are the guys who I think of. And these are the guys who I think of are just like sort of resentful, sort of nothing type people. And they'll go back to eating tofu and making coffees, you know. I'm not really intimidated by them. But when I look at the MAGA movement, that's another sort of ground up, grassroots, sort of working class type movement. I don't necessarily agree that communism is going to be the answer in, for what these guys are looking for. But I do think that there is a very revolutionary spirit about these guys. Like when, I, when you see the Trump rally, it's like these are normal everyday people getting together, going to these massive rallies, and there, there is a spirit of that revolution about them. Also, when you think about it, these Antifa guys, quote unquote Antifa, I don't think they're anti-fascists, but regardless, when they're going out on the street and like, you know, engaging in violence, I mean, what is it in the name of? Because I don't actually think it's really revolutionary. I think they're enforcing violently the will of the ruling class, you know, whether it's big pharma, whether it's the military industrial complex, whether it's the Democratic Party, or whether it's the institutions of universities and elsewhere. They're basically resorting to criminal means to enforce monopoly capital and those in power. So, I mean, historically speaking, it's like they have a lot more in common, actually. I know this is like a Dinesh D'Souza take, but it's actually true. Like, they actually do have more in common with the Italian black shirts and the brown shirts in Germany. They're just kind of these criminal thugs violently attacking normal people to enforce a dictatorship, right? It's interesting. Whereas they are in paid Maga, by, 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 like, special interest NGOs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, if you look at who funds these people and where they get their ideas from and who funds those ideas, it's very clear how they're attached to the to those who already are in power, right? And I look at MAGA and like sociologically, MAGA seems a lot more similar if you look at it from a historical perspective to the mass politics that was communist in nature, not not only in Russia, not only in China, but even in Europe, right? There was a German Communist Party. There were socialists and communist parties all over Europe. Their base were rugged, working class, masses of normal people, not antisocial freaks who just wanted to, you know, mm. violently terrorize people. And I, yeah, but I, I do think that you get a lot, like the, you know, Patrice Cullors, the leader of BLM, said that she's a trained Marxist and you do get a lot of these Antifa guys carrying around the hammer and sickle. If you enjoyed that reality-based podcast clip and you want to get early access to all upcoming episodes, then join our community at Locals, rattlesnaketv.locals.com. Furthermore, if you prefer the Audible version, then you can find the reality-based podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and all major streaming platforms. All those links will be below. See you there.